same time, we've become the world's largest producer of uranium, an essential ingredient in nuclear weapons. If our opposition to nuclear arms is not to be hypocritical, we must be meticulous in ensuring that none of it winds up in the U.S. military stream. We have a treaty with the United States to ensure that it doesn't. But if you follow the trail of our uranium south of the border, it's hard to escape the conclusion of one U.S. critic that there's a piece of Canada in every American nuclear bomb. Under cover of darkness, a truck carrying radioactive spent fuel rolls across the Thousand Island Bridge near Kingston, Ontario. These protesters are concerned about the safe transport of nuclear material. But their ultimate nightmare is the terrifying buildup of the nuclear arsenal. Building the bomb is so little understood and so greatly feared that even people in the know like to take refuge in the shadowy half-truth that you can separate atoms for peace from atoms for war. Dr. Gordon Edwards of the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility. I think it's a, it's a convenient myth. It's a convenient fairy tale that we have chosen to, to live under that, uh, that one can truly make a distinction between atoms for peace and atoms for war. The truth of the matter is that the civilian program is piggybacking on the military program and always has. When man harnessed the power of the atom, he unleashed a force so destructive that it set off a chain reaction of events that changed the course of history and left the world poised in a delicate balance of terror. Canada supplied the uranium and some of the scientific know-how to help build the bombs which were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The successful testing of the ultimate weapon was so challenging that scientists basked in the afterglow of their achievement, as this U.S. government film shows. But faced with the specter of annihilation, the Americans, almost overnight, began to downplay atoms for war and extol the virtue of atoms for peace. In 1965, Prime Minister Lester Pearson echoed these sentiments when he attached tough new conditions to the exports of Canadian uranium. Permits will be granted, or commitments to issue export permits will be given with respect to sales of uranium covered by contracts entered into from now only if the uranium is to be used for peaceful purposes. What assurance do we have that this uranium is truly being used for peaceful purposes? Or is it a case of the emperor's new clothes? You know, that uh, somehow we just haven't bothered to say, look, the emperor does have no clothes. That really, this uranium must be being used for military purposes. I think that we're fooling ourselves. So who's fooling whom? Canada, in public at least, has always taken a hard line against the spread of nuclear weapons. After India exploded a bomb made from Canadian uranium in 1974, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau again toughened control. Speaking before the UN special session on disarmament in 1978, he appealed for a halt to the arms race. The conclusion I have reached is that the best way of arresting the dynamic of the nuclear arms race may be by a strategy of suffocation, by depriving the arms race of the oxygen on which it feeds. But the arms race continued to escalate, fueled by fear and the essential raw material, uranium. Canada has always been a major supplier of uranium, but it goes through so many changes in the huge military industrial complex that it's difficult for outsiders to find out exactly where it goes and what it's used for. William Arkins of Washington's Institute for Policy Studies. And it is only within the last two or three years that we have enough knowledge about nuclear weapons and the flow of materials and um, enough knowledge about the way weapons are constructed and enough knowledge about the usage of the various materials, plutonium, uranium, tritium, that we're able even to put together the conclusive evidence that would show the flow of all of the materials from Canadian mines through production into weapons. To understand how some Canadian uranium finds its way into American weapons, W-5 traced the flow of shipments from Canada to key nuclear facilities in the United States. 
Much of the uranium starts its journey from the Key Lake Mine in northern Saskatchewan. Key Lake is the world's largest mine, operating around the clock and producing 12 million pounds of uranium yellow cake a year. After a long cross-Canada trip, the uranium is trucked to the Crown-owned El Dorado Nuclear Refinery in southern Ontario. Here, it's converted into a salt-like solid before being exported. Next morning, a truck carrying empty casks arrives from Kentucky to pick up a shipment. It's just after dawn at Fort Hope, Ontario. Most of the town is still asleep. Trucks loaded with Canadian uranium, which has been refined at the plant here, roll out, bound for the United States. One wonders if Canadians would sleep as sound if they knew that almost certainly a lot of this Canadian uranium winds up in the making of American nuclear bombs. A few days later, the truck pulls up to the enrichment plant at Paducah, Kentucky. Because Canada has no enrichment plants of its own, most of our uranium goes to the U.S. to be enriched, whether it's destined for an American or foreign customer. We followed this shipment to Paducah, one of the three enrichment plants run by the U.S. Department of Energy. It's here for the first time that Canadian uranium loses its identity. It's blended with uranium from other sources as it's sped in a continuous stream through miles of tubes and pipes. The end product is uranium-235, a radioactive explosive material that's capable of sustaining a chain reaction. To get one part of U-235, you have to discard 140 parts of U-238, a non-explosive material known as depleted uranium. This is how it's separated. The uranium is heated to a gaseous form and filtered through a series of barriers. After the process is repeated many times, the enriched uranium, on the right, goes out the front door for use in civilian reactors. The much larger pile goes out the back door to be stockpiled. These tails of depleted uranium have virtually no civilian use. We asked Arkin how we can be certain that no Canadian material winds up in weapons. There is no way that physically, and there is no way figuratively, that we have separated out the Canadian um, materials so that they did not go into the warhead. Is it a case, in fact, that this is stamped with a maple leaf so that you know that it's Canadian? The answer is no, it's not. This year, the American plants will produce 16,000 tons of depleted uranium. The U.S. military is free to draw on this stockpile, and Canadian uranium is neither identified nor segregated. We confirmed this with plant manager Bill Sykes. Is there any segregation of the Canadian uranium in the stockpiling no, process? No, sir. So uh, it's not uh, stamped with a maple leaf or no, anything? This no, no. Well, once the, the product is removed, it's removed in our product cylinders and sent on for further enrichment. The depleted uranium is removed in government tail cylinders for storage here at this plant. For the military to use the depleted uranium, it must first undergo yet another conversion, so it heads down the road again. Bernald, Ohio. It's here that they've located a key facility for the building of America's nuclear weapons. And it's here, too, that Canada's so-called peaceful uranium is diverted into America's nuclear weapons program. The Feeds Material Production Center is a civilian site with a military purpose, and thus, much tighter security. This year, 4,000 metric tons of depleted uranium will arrive here solely for military application. Row upon row of depleted uranium sits and drums in the receiving yard, waiting to be converted into uranium metal. What percentage is Canadian is anybody's guess, depending on what batch it came from. Inside the factory, the metal fuel cores that emerge from the production line are essential in the making of plutonium, the trigger of every modern bomb. Plant manager, Jim Schneider. What's your product coming out the other end of your production line at your plant? The product here is a, what we call an ingot, or a fuel core that's used uh, for production of fuel elements or fuel targets at the Richland production reactor in Richland, Washington, and the Savannah River production reactor in Savannah, Georgia. 
these production reactors are used in the U.S. defense programs in production of plutonium. Is that in the making of nuclear weapons? Yes. From Fernald, the fuel cores go on to Savannah River, where they're inserted into military reactors to breed weapons-grade plutonium. But the use of depleted uranium does not end there. Another stream goes to a plant at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where it's made into metal bomb components. All the parts then go on to a plant in Amarillo, Texas, for final assembly into warheads. This diagram shows how much depleted uranium goes into a modern warhead. The yellow parts come from depleted uranium. It's at the heart of the plutonium spark plug, but also in the metal casing that boosts the bang by 50%. We asked William Arkin what depleted uranium looked like. He bought this hunk on the open market for educational purposes. As you'll see, it's very heavy. This is depleted uranium. Every nuclear weapon in the U.S. stockpile with the exception of neutron bombs, have depleted uranium in them. This, then, is either a third Canadian or a quarter to a third Canadian, or it's all Canadian, depending upon which batch it happened to come out of. But the point is that the Department of Energy does not segregate any of the uranium which the Canadians provide them in any way. So in the processing of highly enriched uranium, in the processing of fuel rods for making plutonium, in the processing of depleted uranium for use as depleted uranium, you can say that, well, that there's a little bit of Canada in every nuclear warhead. In every American nuclear warhead. That's correct. But our agreement with the United States, first signed in 1955 and amended in 1980, is clear. No Canadian uranium, not a single molecule, is to be used for military purposes. Over the past 20 years, Washington, and especially Ottawa, seem to have placed more importance on the pure symbolism of their nuclear treaty than they did on its substance. While on paper the treaty's tough enough, in practice, a series of Canadian governments have, by ignorance or design, failed to ensure that Washington live up to its side of the bargain. The key point is, the Canadian government, that traditionally has made much of our insistence on not using uh, uranium for nuclear purposes. We should be insisting that all of our uranium that goes to the United States be segregated from any uranium that they use for military purposes. It's as simple and as clear-cut as that. That's what the treaty says. And we, on the Canadian side, our government should be enforcing that. This week in New York, we asked External Affairs Minister Joe Carr if he could guarantee that not a smidgen of Canadian uranium winds up in American nuclear weapons. Uh, you can't put a flag on a molecule of, of uranium and follow it through the process. And so it is, it is difficult to know uh, that a particular molecule going in is the same particular molecule that comes out. Not being able to identify it molecule by molecule, the arrangement that has been established internationally by all countries, by us for some time, uh, has been to uh, ensure that the same amount of Canadian uranium that goes in uh, comes out and is called Canadian and is subject to the very strict uh, obligations that, uh, that flow from our, our treaty arrangements. I've learned a little bit about this since I've learned of your interest. Uh, and there is uh, a process called the process of fungibility, uh, which also applies to banks. When you put a buck in the bank and expect to get a buck back uh, uh, later on, you're not going to get back the same dollar that you, you put in. Uh, what you do is get back an equivalent dollar. The same process applies uh, in this case. Well, maybe the word should be fungibility, because it, uh, it clearly uh, goes against the, the law of the treaty. We also asked Mr. Clark if this so-called principle of fungibility applied to depleted uranium as well. I would have to uh, find out what happens to the uh, uh, to the, um, the residue, uh, but I would presume that uh, it, is, it is covered by the uh, same agreements which uh, uh, prohibit the uh, direct uh, uh, um, use of um, um, Canadian uranium for uh, non-peaceful purposes. But W-5 was told that the principle of fungibility does not apply to depleted uranium. According to expert interpretations, depleted uranium falls through the cracks of the many treaties covering atomic energy.
It is this bureaucratic concept of fungibility that allows the Canadian government to respect the letter of the treaty while continuing to violate its spirit. Warren Donnelly, nuclear policy expert for the U.S. Library of Congress, says that in the end, there are only two ways Canada can be absolutely certain that none of its uranium ends up in nuclear weapons. Well, the one way to have absolute assurance would be to have the depleted uranium of Canadian origin returned to Canada. Uh, a somewhat less expensive uh, measure might be to try and get the United States to segregate that uh, depleted uranium at the U.S. production facilities. This is Fat Man. It's a replica of one of the world's first atomic bombs. And it's no secret that there was a lot of Canadian help in the building of that bomb. Now it seems, whether we knew it or not, whether we liked it or not, there's been a lot of Canadian help in building virtually all of America's bombs since. These days, the Reagan administration is committed to a further buildup of nuclear weapons. And it's reasonable to assume that there will be a little piece of Canada in all of those, too. If nothing is done to inhibit this process, it makes a hollow mockery of Canada's position as a fierce opponent of nuclear weapons. Thank <laughs> you.